So good evening. I'm Robert Polito, director of the New School Writing Program, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this evening uh, as part of our ongoing collaboration with Cave Canem. The Cave Canem Poetry Prize is an award with a distinguished legacy from Indigo Moore through Natasha Threthaway and Major Jackson on to Crazy K. Smith and the present, among many others. And that distinguished legacy continues tonight. So I want to thank all of our friends at Cave Canem, especially Allison Myers and Haviza Jeter. And it's my pleasure now to turn the evening over to the executive director of Cave Canem, Allison Myers. Thanks, Robert. Um, of course, we'd, Cave Canem would like to thank Robert Polito and Lori Lynn Turner of the New School for making such a welcoming place for Cave Canem poetry, not just tonight, but many nights throughout the years. And uh, we also want to uh, thank our funders who have supported our programming, the National Endowment for the Arts for supporting the Cave Canem Poetry Prize, the University of Pittsburgh Press, our publishing partner, and the New School the Mrs. Giles Whiting Foundation and the New York State Council on the Arts for their support of tonight's program. And thank you, our audience, for participating. Please stay and join us for a reception at the conclusion of the program. And we encourage you to visit the book table for copies of our poets' collections. As Robert mentioned, the Cave Canem Poetry Prize is a distinguished award. It's a first book award made annually for an exceptional manuscript by an African-American poet. And tonight we celebrate with readings by the 2001 winner, Nicole Therese Dutton, honorable mention, Lauren Elaine, and our distinguished judge, Patricia Smith, who will introduce Nicole, our final reader. It's a great pleasure to introduce Lauren Kesey Ann Elaine, a talented poet and generous hearted Cave Canem fellow I've admired since joining CC's community several years ago. There is much to praise in Lauren's what Kept Us, the beautifully composed manuscript Patricia Smith selected as an honorable mention for the 2011 prize. Here are poems about loss and joy and the many complications of love. How the complex body is both the root of and barrier to experience. Alternately, machine, beast, soul, greed, accident, or the representation of simple survival. As expressed in her poem, X-Ray, these lyrics lay bare the marrow, examine an interior life and dream world, then turn their faces outward to the world with messages of celebration, cultural displacement, the transport of temporal sensation, and the torment and regret of violence and self-destruction. What kept us also chronicles and weaves mysteries around the life of a girl at 7, 14, 18. This elegant manuscript comprises epistolary poems written by the adult to this girl hurtling into womanhood, love poems, and poems of witness. In these pages, we enjoy reading near sonnets, huzzles, and the poet's own unique forms forged in such tri striking images as your sandbag body and ex extended similes like this one from the poem Elegy. Friend, I hope death was like a rescue that he came in a fireman's clothes and carried you on his shoulders. An honorable mention for the Cave Canem Poetry Prize is one in an impressive list of recognitions accorded Lauren's poetry, including, among others, an international publication prize from the Atlantic Monthly, the Robert Chasen Graduate Poetry Prize at Cornell, and an honorable mention for the 2009 Reginald Shepard Memorial Poetry Prize, her poems have appeared in the anthologies Growing Up Girl and Gathering Ground, and in Crab Orchard Review, the Caribbean Writer and other literary journals. An assistant professor of English and poet in residence at the University of Dubuque, her chapbook, Dawn in the Catskills, was published in 2008 by Longshore Press. Please join me now in welcoming to the podium a talented, compelling writer, Lauren Elaine. Thank you. I feel like I can just leave now. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so indebted to Kaveh Kanem for so many gifts, um, of the encouragement of this prize, but also uh, finding me and taking me in and uh, making me uh, so much of the writer that I, I'm still trying to become. 
So thank you so much, Cece. Um, to avoid any confusion, I picked the poems in advance. And I'm going to start with the poem that made me realize that I think I was done with what this manuscript was trying to do. And it happened about three weeks before the CC Prize deadline. And I knew, I was like, OK, I'm, this is it. This is the one I'm sending to you guys. Um, and it's 18. It's a long series of somewhat sonnets. 18. Tonight, you are full of small rivers, your eyes salty runoff, the rust bright trickle staining your thigh, the unnameable, undamned flooding in your chest. You are drowning in all of them. Sweet girl, of course you do not have the words. It will take you almost 10 years to find them. They are both more powerful and less useful than you can believe in this night when your hands and faith have failed you, when your mouth is an absence of screams. Some rivers are wider than any courage. I give you nothing as you sink alone under those waters. This is how I am born. Under those waters, you labor to birth me. For days, you are dead to alarms, knocks, rings, messages with their battery of concern and questions you have no answer for. You have made yourself impenetrable to insistence with sleep's shadowy armor, with a silence that consumes all sound whole. You are beyond the world's reach, which is one kind of safety. I can only imagine that bodiless place, its darkness like a sweet in the mouth. The secrets you learned there delivered me, your miracles scream, your dark voice. Together we left that realm of smoke, returned to this country of blood. We awoke. You wake up, but you can never return. No matter what country you burden with dreams of home, if there are rivers, if blood or tears or time flow there, if memory lives or is buried there, if leaving was your own doing, if you were captured or borrowed or lost, if the doors were cast wide or if you pried them open, if there are doors or doorways, your name is not a key. Return has no means in any language, no lines around it on any map, to go back is a verb conjugated in dreams that dissolves on your tongue when you wake up reaching for it. You seek a different debt, choose a different verb to forget. And you forgot. You moved through your days easy with lightness that was not untrue. You lifted weights and danced, you biked and ran, you moved and moved never still long enough for your shadow to settle. You visited familiar countries, not quite the same as returning made home the body's wild contours. You wore short skirts and spiky heels. You held bottles to your mouth and sparked fire to your face, learned to suck the smoke in and feel it swirling there next to your heart. You defied sleep, worked the late shift at bars instead of dreaming. You kept your eyes open, your gaze fixed ahead on the slippery horizon. Oh, slippery horizon, seeming fixed just within reach is your most perfect trick. You keep us going by it, hang your dazzle like the perfect carrot, we chomp and chomp towards you. When you're bright enough, we need never look behind. Who wants to reach back when the future beckons, a kept promise? 18, you know everything is at stake, your possible life, your hopes of making good, your some nagging truth, your sanity, pride. It is not a choice, this horizon, but the bearable path. We have faith in the sign saying, this way to happiness, you're closer every day. You believe happiness is the bearable vision of yourself, the woman who lives certain in her skin, the woman who walks unafraid, whose throat out thunders thunder. Each day she unwinds the bright rope of her will, harnesses the hours for her pleasure. Her laughter is an open door, happy her heart, empty of longing, happy is her dreamless and unvisited sleep. She is a bullet, a bird, all things swift and light that ride on wind. She will not turn. She will answer to no name but her own. She is entire. She makes herself wide so nothing can hold her. She holds all inside. We hold all, 18. But not everything dies because we believe burial and end. 
Something waits to make gardens of us, to wreath us with quiet thorns. It grows fat and bursts its skin in us, thrives in our rivers, waits in our dark. It sets down roots, long fingers probing the earth of us. It breaks free and breathes the air of us. It reaches for our light. It creeps along our path 18, it thickens, it clings. Inside our bodies, something always waits to disappear, to burn, or to startle us with bloom. It unfolds un obscene flowers, a doom of petal litters us, our breath, their fragrance, heavy, bitter. For years they scent our daily air, heavy, breath after breath we press on, the story ripening in us, its eyes looking through ours in the mirror. We have not seen our face without its shadow for almost 10 years, and now this. In a class on violence against women, the professor prophesies this moment. It will come for anyone who has suffered trauma. We do not believe we are anyone until we are sobbing for the night that the boy you liked held you down and made you bleed. Again, the rivers. But this time I come, bearing a word, rape. We cling to the raft of it, begin our escape. In the raft of language, we make our escape. We hold ourselves tightly inside it, whisper its single syllable like a spell. The word means it was not your fault for liking him, for kissing him, for leaning into the touch he pressed against your shoulders, despite your desire, despite the first thrill, the word means you said no to, and that matters. The word tells you you are not being punished by God. The word means you are not weak, not stupid, not damned. You were a victim, not a tease, not a cautionary tale, not a moral lesson. This is what a word can give definition, meaning, the closest we can get to salvation. Meaning is the closest we get to salvation, which is to say the word changes nothing. It does not unmake the rivers, cannot erase them from the landscape of us. Spells have their limits, which is to say return means too late to be saved in any language. The longing is to be pure, but what you get is to be changed. 18, we will carry our dark. We will birth ourselves again and again. We will tend our gardens, harvest the difficult fruit. We will apprentice ourselves to the work and learn the language that will allow us to summon our own angels. We survive. We go on. We cross these rivers. We live. Thank you. If Sky. Wish for a working machine and you're given a body. Ask for options and you get a life with no roadmap and a compass called free will. Say, give me a reason, and what you get is silence or wars, continents too far away to care without exertion. If you say yes to knowing, dispossession flowers in you and cleaves to your progeny for centuries. If you wish to forget, there are pills with mild side effects, dreams that grab you by the throat, and pockets of fear that separate you from your skin. If you sing hymns, the gods of memory might waken and strike you with elegies for your unguarded heart. Ask for love, and the sky will unveil itself, layer by layer, its naked blue flame wanting only your blindness in return. Seven. In this picture, your dress is burning white. Your veil engulfs your head like lacy flames. Your snoopy watch flares red on your wrist. You clutch your white handbag like a wish. Little Christ bride, you are innocence embodied down to your white knee socks, Mary Janes, and unpierced ears. Your parents are stiff with pride, their afros not yet streaked white with worry. Behind you, your godmothers hold fast to their vows and your shoulders. Nanny George alive and beaming, Auntie Patsy whispering into your ear, real as the statue of Mary in the background. Everything in this moment is true, dear Seven. But even truth is not impervious to time, and we lose so much. 
even this day's memory will thin and disappear. But you already sense this, the anticipation already giving way to something else you cannot name, as you solemnly wait to be captured, bending your smile into the camera's light. 30. This morning you start from a dream seasoned with bourbon. Can you tell Kavi Khanum was involved in that? <laughs> this morning you start from a dream seasoned with bourbon. Last night roils in your stomach, funks your breath, aches. A message lights your phone asking, did you get home safe? And you answer, yes. And you wonder if this is what it means to grow up. You don't learn sense. You still find yourself swirling in a strange city in your reckless boots, the hum and shudder of liquor driving your feet. Still, your heart parades its glitter for would-be lovers, dissolve as they install themselves in other women's arms. What you learn is how to exit with grace. Despite the dark, the sputtering street lamp that is your only moon, you learn to believe the streets will unfold in the right direction if you just start walking. And when you find you can walk no further, a man with a beautiful accent and a meter will appear on his metal hinge steed and whisk you toward whatever place your weary mouth conjures. Call it home. 30, maybe older and wiser, is just learning how to put yourself in your own good hands, that you will wake up snug in your solitary bed, your favorite pajamas soft against your skin, your hair tucked into its stocking cap, a glass of water on the nightstand waiting to slake your morning thirst. <laughs> Sorry. Let's do one more. Um, and I don't think Roger is here, but he uh, wrote a poem called Burial Instructions for the Lovely Death. And I wrote this poem after I read that one. It's When the Angels Come. When the angels come, let them bring wings. Let the wings be poems exquisite with the give of each I am. Let the music be a harmonic of steel pan and surf, Congo drum and share, my godmother's shaky soprano and the sweet thud of flesh falling away. Let my thousand selves sing. Let me tug my loved one's coats and let them catch me in the afternoon's solitary star. Let the dead make way with hallelujahs. In their rain voices, let them whisper to me. Let each lived moment of love light a path from this world to the next. O oh gods, when you call me in all the names I have worn through with breathing, let me answer with joy. Let me go up, let me go dancing, ecstatic with flight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for your gorgeous poems. It's such a great pleasure to hear you read. I'm sure your manuscript will find a publisher soon. So Patricia Smith, Kaveh Khanum owes you a praise song for your contributions of time, talent, and treasure, and your ongoing mentoring of emerging poets, including your thoughtful judging of the 2011 Kaveh Khanum Poetry Prize. We're very grateful for your work and love. Thank you. <laughs> Patricia has published seven acclaimed collections of poetry. Most recently should have been Jimmy Savannah, a memoir in verse exploring the second wave of the Great, Mi Great Migration, described by Sapphire as a stunning and transcendent work of art. Her Blood Dazzler was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award, and Tea House of the Almighty was a National Poetry Series selection and recipient of the first Hurston Wright Award in Poetry. Additional honors include a Pushcart Prize, the Carl Sandburg Award, and induction into the National Literary Hall of Fame for Writers of African Descent. She is a four-time National Poetry Slam individual champion, has been featured on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, and has written and performed three one-woman plays, one of which was produced by Derek Walcott's Trinidad Theater Workshop. A Kaveh Khanum faculty member, Patricia is a professor at the City University of New York College of Staten Island. And uh, yep, that's it. I know you're teaching. I know you're teaching at a new uh, low-res residency program, but 
let's just welcome Patricia to the podium. She will grace us with some of her poems and introduce Nor uh, Nicole. Thank you. Doesn't <laughs> matter. Hi, everybody. Um, as uh, usual, I would like to uh, thank Cave Canem for its unleashed love and nurturing. Um, I'm very, very happy to be. It's very difficult to judge the contest, as you might imagine. Um, and I was very happy to hear Lauren. It was wonderful to hear those words and go back to that moment where I was like, <laughs> 10 manuscripts. Woo! Uh, anyway, so I was trying to figure out what to read. I have two poems, so I figured I would read Kaveh Kanem poems. Uh, not written in Kaveh Kanem, but about Kaveh Kanem. One written about the residency and one written about one of the, uh, the local classes, uh, one of the New York classes. The first one was written, it was Saturday night, all stories at Kaveh Kanem start. Uh, <laughs> it was Saturday night, and Reginald Dwayne Betts was sitting on the floor, and there was, a, uh, there was a circle of women around him, twisting, this is when he was going to start his, his uh, dreads, twisting his naps, oiling his, and twisting his naps, like a whole circle of women, and so that's where this came from. <laughs> sitting in a circle of cooing colored women. Your head was stunned between the knees of one while she pulled the snapping comb through resistant naps, smeared lines of sweet oil along the parts, coiled segments around her forefinger, then twisted until someone loud whispered to someone else, that brother gonna be too fine with those dreads. <laughs> it was insistent miracle, the women of the temple identifying you as possible, running their fingers through the tangle of your head and saying, almost to themselves, yes, yes, this one. Without being asked, we took it upon ourselves to build you again, weaving the slow, addicting stench of sex into your hair. Yes, this one. Scar, tremble. Yes, this one. Circumstance and cage. Yes, this one. Knotted bicep, leaping verb. I knew as I watched that the new birth locks would not survive that some hour of unleashed fever would lead you to a blade, anxious to shear the unfamiliar heat. What hurtled through your veins was not blood, it was the liquid rush of opening doors. Forgive us for believing it was our right to define freedom, to smother you with cooking, breast, sleep, and warm water, mouths straining toward your ripped landscape, our hands deep in, desperate to rearrange, lock down what adorns you, to resurrect, to resurrect. Black women need to own you. They slice jail bars soft with Jesus songs. You want to say, man, out loud. Stand not because of us, but with us. And one day, you will scream mother while shaving our red-lipped history from your head. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, the, the other poem is called Ten Throats. And this was written for my students in the Cave Canem Regional Workshop 2007. Um, among those students were Mahogany Brown and Roger Bonaire Garb. Um, and this was written on the last day after they had really just driven me quietly crazy. <laughs> and there were 10 of them. I am the ten throats, the gathering storm, the muttered invective, the unruly Negro. I am ten sheltered villages, conjured countries, imploded horizons. I sing with a heart so irreparably, irreparably broken, the record skips to save me. I am perched in the front pew, showered and anointed by the preacher's spittle. I teeter on the last bar stool by the back door, balancing shot glasses full of testimony. I sit by the closed window in a darkened room, willing the window to open. I rest along my cluttered history. We are both very tired. I play hard, peppering my knees with splinters. I pray hard, peppering my knees with splinters. God reconsiders me 
when I undress for strangers. And underneath these swaddling clothes, I am a constantly reworked stanza, womb and forehead, penis and knee. Dragging drying ballpoints across legal pads, soft pounding keyboards deep into midnights, I chisel and sculpt and reweave what is naked about me. Syllables become masks, verbs become diversions, nouns are what they always were, the lies you don't see in snapshots. I am the ten suspects in custody, the clatter of a tin cup across the bars of a cage. Every word I've ever written begs for the key. Please give me the key. I am the five double negatives, the hour before surrender, a bitch on wheels, a clinically controlled, mitigated disaster, the blue notes trapped in limbo the day the jukebox stopped taking quarters. I am the phase the moon refuses to acknowledge when its filtered light scrapes the sky red. Please give me the key. And I will unlock for you a nasty alleyway, complete with crystal stairways and skittering vermin. I will unlock for you your own chest wall, releasing the hurricane water, revealing the sweet putrid meat that thumps relentlessly and forces you upright. I will twist the key, and the lock will groan like a world hip woman fingering her universe, and the door will open the way that universe blooms, tinged to a shiver with compromised blood, the menstrual river. The door will open upon a poem, a fractured slice of something. My story unravels languid, slow liquid, lazy legend, and yes, it is your story. Remember that I am the unruliest of Negroes, charged with the impossible task, the telling of us. Together, we are mother, dyke, mulatto, crave, Africa, barrio, tropics, mutter, delphonics, rejected daughter, teeth, traveler, almost dead, flirt, Mississippi, drunkard, constantly spinning, shy town, history, 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 history. Thank you for the key, for permission to be ugly and a whipper of language in religion's huge way, for granting me access to this altar of stacked footprints all heading back, and for these ten tortured throats, sore, shut tight, but somehow screeching. Thank you. It's funny, all these years at Cave Canem, and you look up and you see Cornelius, it's like the, the principal just walked in the room. <laughs> it's like, oh, Cornelius is here. Did I use any bad words? <laughs> all right, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Nicole. Um, I, I love giving introductions. It, it kind of allows me to kind of go off on, on very in weird tangents, I think. Um, I should just get up here and say accolades, but I had to have a story, so bear with me. Uh, as some of you know, I teach creative writing for the College of Staten Island, and I love how my students challenge and test me how they keep me starkly tuned to possible, how they thread their desperate stories of youthful angst and betrayal with double negatives and clunky rhyme and still manage to create a magic that's drenched in their signature. I guide them gently. No wide allowed words that say everything and say absolutely nothing. Love, emotion, dream, beauty, heartbreak, <laughs> soul, <laughs> I call these words placeholders for the work that is yet to be done. I don't want love. I want an unbridled shudder that directly affects the spine. I want them to describe the landscape of a kiss so deep it made their feet swell. I don't want a dream with its blurred ind indefinite borders. I want to read about a midnight that slaps their heads full round. I don't need another anything described as simply beautiful I want that bladed rumba in their chests when their eyes sweep across it, whatever it is. And heartbreak, the state all of them seem to live in. <laughs> Weeping and wringing their hands and checking their text messages, I'm amazed that they can find no better way to say it, since every time it happens, it shifts a life on its flimsy little axis. But let us talk about soul. Soul is the word they can't shake but I still say it's a waste of a syllable, so I ask them to define it. 
and almost every one of their answers is some version of this. It's where everything we feel lives. Still, I think, it's a waste of a syllable. You define it, they tell me. I hate when they do that. <laughs> so I carry that quest around with me for days until suddenly I know. The soul, for me, is where language flexes and clutches, where the delicious collision of two words can drive me a little mad as they combine to describe something that doesn't yet exist. The soul is where my first lines languish. It's a landscape of stilted starts and wavering tenses. It's scratch outs and screams into cupped hands and days without bathing. The soul is where sounds flaunt their ability to devastate and lay me to glittering waste. It is a shadowy, locked place that quivers now and again with all that is possible, dangerous, and yes, I will use the word beautiful. I felt that tremor as I went back to Nicole's words again and again, astonished as she dared a lyrical territory, untried and unproven, and stamped it with fierce signature. When we read the word of others, we may link to a line, a clever passage, a whole poem that pulls a question to the surface and then answers it. But it's rare that we are pulled, flailing and not yet ready, into a singular world of the poet's own creation. Seldom that we pick up a book and put it down whole mind revolutions later. Much and most of the work I saw was stellar, memorable, and startling. It was zeroing in consistently on the location of that strange, chaotic place I define as soul. But it was the words of Nicole Therese Dutton that actually reached that place over and over. And even now, when I open her amazing newborn book, the tremor is still there. Still. Nicole Therese Dutton, everybody. And she's got some stuff she did too. Thank you. It's such an honor to, to be recognized this way. Kave Khanum has meant so much to me. And um, I just want to thank, I want to thank you, Cornelius. Thank you, Toy. Thank you, Allison, for working so hard for this manuscript. Thank you, Patricia, for, for giving me the opportunity to bring this work into the world this way. Um, and thank all of you for being here. Starlight Elsewhere. Hunger is an old story, a threadbare afternoon torn open as if by mice in the bones of a cold house. The family, that weird station, that series of events will never be enough. Kick yourself off on another adventure then. Whatever story you need can shout itself loudest over the gutted rooms. This is not fate. This is firewood. You are not lost. You are transposed. You are starlight elsewhere. Someone's grass-stained child overrun with rain, a taste of bitterness, the red mouth and weak eyes. You are not gone, not vanished. You are flying, hair blown back. And in this posture, this constant motion, Look how suddenly you belong, how old circumstances fit you like bad shoes, same as anyone. Even before you reach the pier, it is plain sky broke its promises and crumbled into sea, how light becomes a kingdom of salt, how the sea continues, restless and tossing, your name within it, a small muscle, a smooth and silent stone. Woman, I am falling. Water, a house designed by genius, the genius ignoring the slide rules and proportions of his colleagues, who in turn ignore their pin-curled wives, wives with missing silk hose and seam lines penciled up their slender calves. It was depression is, after all, woman, there was a certain attachment to gravity that required disruption, I promise. We needed something impossible to believe in an equal and opposite Cerebus hound. In this moment of empires with slit bellies beached amongst the shambled mulings of other fallen empires, woman, we needed the whole of it, jettisoned, had to, baby and bathwater both. What a terrible thing to become accustomed to, 
a casserole of lukewarm equations, which is to say, I was dire with circumstance. And since hunger nicely puts all that aside, the agency of certain particulars, for example, I bedeviled my calculations, got them soused and barefoot on the avenue of Americas. I collected my best scrap, lipstick smiles abandoned on champagne flutes, the sweat of bodies drunk with the proximal stillness every city folds into the smallest possible hours. I promise, with every organic impulse, twinkling in the rinds of much better conversation, woman, I am falling water. I am summoned into angle and the clean line so worth saying. It is always worth saying. In every crucial time, in all signatures, through the microphones and lacquer bells, dear, lasting is not everything. Look at the pieces I break myself into. How otherwise to articulate this feeling? I am trying to show you onward with great velocity. We beasts carrying our beast hearts within us to the edges of the world. I'm saying how we want with everything to go. Thank you. This next poem is called M Elements and it's for Michael Coppola. There must be a train station never arrived at. Smoky boxcar teak and rum, a dark Jamaican who won't say a lot. Eyes, small dimes behind frames, furniture heavy but attentive to a woman speaking in oboes, clay floor to moons under her nails. Think agreement, bouquets beneath polyester, and somewhere between Rochester and Milwaukee, his eyes latch and hold, possibly baseball cards, a pint of hot dam or cardboard town scraping dark landscapes by. Think someone nearly gorgeous, a name without a saint, loyal to the Mets, an optimist, ways we fall asleep, hands entwined, crook to crook rocking. Some dreams, they don't arrive on the backs of tossing ponies. But for now, everything is beginning. The boxcar and muscular silk against crow's eyes, his sleepy way of guessing the number of miles by the dust in her hair. Welcome home. In the nick of school buses, office slacks, the rest of the game, welcome home, girl. Critical objects to fragment and pony, sure, but I got this soft shoe double step down. Books all memorized. You rolled some tardy and went fish-eyed in the cut. A tired, trifling air kiss bye-bye, but that is the providence of maybe. These jokes have teeth, so I'm rocking my apples on home, my flunked cadenzas and reasons why not. We're tripping the fung wall back to gasoline shingled grown folk talk and late night Stella with Isak drunk on Jesus and hollering pulled pork televisions. The last real place known. Cops steady taking turns, taking us out. Protocol spreading countless eagles across the hoods of America. Never mind holding anything said or done against. I'm going back. Argyle over crunk. More transmorphography than any flavor hyphenation ever learned me. Just mighty lock and pop of hammer shank and cornrow. 400,000 verbs banging like nobody's brer told you so. And that's razzle dazzle, kid. Gold standard sonnets and shit. Just like old heads gospelizing on the stoop like backbeat beating, young guns dealing, hand-me-down jokes and ball, same stories. Musician year, mojo men, mommy's gonna be serious, breaking down another dawn, shout lovely, black, home, like sweet, and thank you, honey, damn. Thank you. This poem is called On Holiday. Your ribs were carried off, perhaps toward Namibia, you thought. It was very unclear. The water was narcotic. It blew your ears out like cheap speakers and left your brain rattling its tin. At one point, you were sure you heard the streets of Mindelo hushed with fado dancers, soft black shoes and hundreds of girls twirling clockwise. Then the waves deepened, moved slower, and the shoreline disappeared. Your friends were not thinking of you. 
stuffed with ham sandwiches and red juice. They were sleepy and glazed in coconut oil. They were going to burn. You were not thinking of them either. You were halfway to Namibia. From the muscled water you called, but the words pelted your face like wedding rice. So you stopped. Let your arms go, cast iron heavy in the salt. Eventually you climbed ashore. Sharp rocks opened your souls, and you understood your weight as more than just thrashing. Your friends beneath their umbrella did not awaken when you returned, and you will not want to mention any of this. Not over vodka that night, or dueling guitars the next. You will want to pack your luggage and kiss their scorched cheeks. You will want something to carry your body in the direction of home and simply go. I just have a couple more poems for you. The Killing Wait for a Telephone Hello. I read this poem for my class and my students didn't know who Etta James was. I was horrified. <laughs> I felt so sad. <laughs> In my home, 700 miles east of this phone booth, you spin the one record you like best. It is good to take scotch slow. Etta James, at age 23, a pool hustler's unclaimed daughter, knew the truth when she walked into the studio and laid down tracks to her platinum and permanently fractured heart, proving there is reason to learn and remember every note, to drink what burns slowly. In my phone booth, 700 miles from home, the receiver is sticky. The ringing continues. My eyes take in tin shacks and nattered fields, but I don't leave a message. You will find the way, following the Gandhi dancer's sweat song. The girl in the bar, beaded like a glass bottle, skirt hitched and his lips on her neck making music of her while together they dance. You will follow the midnight of that. These are the tracks. This is the better story. The one that wakes you up satisfied. The place my voice is an unnamed animal in the kingdom of impossible things where Edda sings a burn that travels your body slowly and where everything you have is enough. <laughs> Gig. Their lives are better without you. Look at the moon faces and raised champagne glasses in this photograph. The dismantled flowers on the church steps, he married last week, and the girl, when you meet her, is well-ironed, kind. Good thing Austin is just one in a string of occasional places, and you, a girl with a Stratocaster growling mud and chrome into microphones, you can't stick around long. After the set, you will all be a litany of vectored facts, talking a scalloped edge around the sweet tea, six eyes parsing the differences between then and now. More creased, more safe, more of each of you. What is there to speak? You are alive within mem the memory of your own skin. You will be whatever creation you choose for the onstage hour, eyes moldering or not, heart lurching or not. Tomorrow is another town with contracts and cheese danishes, but tonight, play them a broom jump. Call it, wear out, be new. I want to read two, two more poems. City of Candy Colored Light. Hope makes us strange and hope makes us kin. By the nose into negative red we go. Four bodies rich with mosquitoes and poison oak sleep unslept staining our sockets and mouths. We follow the queen into this corpus of gin and dice exploded against felt. Collect the clubs and diamonds, acquire a vigilance for triple cherries after midnight. We sit down and learn. On my right, mutton chops battles lucky stripe. Prom queen, equipped with fanny pack and chivas neat, is a Jedi with her cards. 
Her spine, sore from honest work, is a regal, collapsing thing. And while the chips raise their towers of possibility, she will count the dollars, make preparations for the long ride home with a radio between stations. One hour outside city limits, radio waves thin to salt flats and starlight. We're headed that way. We've been where night grows its miles, where the sky kneels down and the horizon flares in all directions. We like the sound of it, the quiet that closes around us, the music that swallows us whole. This, this last poem is called Every Answer is Yes. And before I read it, I want to thank you all again for, for coming and for being here. Every answer is yes. And guitars burning us up quick as malaria, strapped into the hind bucket of secondhand Buicks, speeding away always and always dumbstruck by the drums trundled in our bones the whole interstate home. We love the basement band, drenching us cotton-eared. We love our pomade in polyester bodies, smashing their atoms against other bodies, our habit of becoming massive bumper crops of noise. Sharpened with sweat and honey glaze, we are kindling snake hips swerved to iced Ohio hairpins. We are tucked chins and tuned limbs set for everywhere past curfew, past subdivision tree lawns, crackling black crackle like alarm clocks. This blood hollers all the linking verbs by heart. The jewels inscribed with incongruent and uprising integers, the many, many ways in which we are not small and not sleepy, but born of a pure velocity. We are burning through cassettes and frost-stunted tulips. We love the way we carry power cords in our teeth and wind loops around the block with time to kill. We love and we love and we love, and it doesn't ever matter if we get there. Thank you. So wonderful to hear you read your poems. I love this book so much. And thank you everyone for coming and for supporting our poets. And please buy copies of If One of Us Should Fall. You will be so happy to own this book. Um, please stay for a lovely reception prepared for us by the New School. Uh, chat with one another. Chat with our poets. Socialize. Check out Cave Conum on the website, caveconumpoets.org. Again, let's hear one more round of applause for our three magnificent poets. Thank you.